thank you, Oriel, for having me and for inviting me. Um, I've had a great day uh, uh, chatting with um, Louis and Danny and meeting uh, some of Danny's students. And so I'm really excited to talk to you today. Today I'm going to talk to you about adaptation in a changing world um, or human influences on evolution. Now I understand there are forestry people here and plant ecology people here, so I apologize in advance that I'm going to be talking about animals, but the good thing is that some of the animals do perch in trees, so you'll see at least a little bit of trees in there. Okay. So one of the prevailing questions in biology, of course, is what uh, has generated the biodiversity that we've observed, uh, that we observe today. And so if you look at sort of the tree of life, then you can see we have a uh, lot of diversity. And one of the things that underlies biodiversity is adaptation. And for me, when I'm talking about adaptation, I'm talking about adaptation both within or among populations. And so a classic example of adaptive radiations include the marsupials in Australia, the honey creepers in Hawaii, and the cichlids in the Great Rift Lakes in Africa. Now, when you look at this sort of diversity and you're thinking about adaptation and biodiversity, the question becomes, well, how did this come about to be? How can adaptation work in terms of these adaptive radiations? So if we go out into nature and measure a phenotype, let's just say body size, for example, or tree size, and you're gonna see a distribution of phenotypes. And so the question is, well, what is maintaining that distribution of phenotypes? What is it about the population that is shaping this distribution and has this particular mean. So what we can think of is we can think of a fitness function. So fitness is basically your ability to survive and reproduce. And so if you're this particular phenotype, it means you have a high fitness, which means you have a high probability of surviving and reproducing. However, if you're at this end of the body size or if you're a smaller body size, you have lower fitness, meaning you're less likely to survive and reproduce. Now what can happen is there can be a shift in the fitness function. It could be to an environmental change or something else. But the shift in the fitness function now means that a phenotype that used to have very low fitness now actually has the most fitness. So this smaller body size is now going to be the most likely to survive and reproduce. Whereas what used to have very high fitness now has very low fitness, so less of ability to survive and reproduce. And so basically with this shift in fitness function, what we've done is we've um, elicited selection on that particular population. And after several generations with selection acting on a population, what we would expect is we would see a shift in the distribution of phenotypes so that this population is now what we would call, again, locally adapted. So the fitness function has shifted the distribution of phenotypes. And so the po population has adapted to the selective pressures. Now one of the questions that I'm really interested in is how does selection vary in time and in space? Because, um, and selection can be a bit abstract when I say vary in time and space. So on the y-axis here, we have selection on clutch size. So clutch size is basically the number of eggs a bird will lay in, in their nest. And you have selection on the y-axis and you have positive selection and negative selection and no selection. And so when we're talking about positive selection, what it means is that the more of that trait that you have, the increased fitness you're going to have. So if there's positive selection, it means that there is selection for whatever reason to have more eggs. You can also have neutral selection, so there's no selection. It doesn't matter how many eggs you're going to, to lay. It, 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 the, your ability to survive and reproduce will be the same. And you can also have negative uh, selection. So it's actually not a good thing to be laying eggs. Selection is actually acting on an organism to lay less eggs, which means that for whatever reason, if you're um, the organism, perhaps it's a year of low resources. And so it's better to have fewer eggs uh, to rear and then your, uh, uh, your individual ability to reproduce in increases. Now, historically, what we've done is we've gone out and we've measured selection in one population at one point in time. And when we do this, we're making an assumption, though, that that selection is the same through time. Now, when you actually do longitudinal studies looking at selection, it's actually quite variable. So the data I'm showing are for great tits and on clutch size. And what you can see is that selection can be very dynamic through time. You can have very strong positive selection, very strong negative selection, and then almost no selection at all, depending on the year. Now, again, this was for one population, and so if you've done it for one population, though, that means that if you look at another population, you're assuming it's going to be the same. 
However, when you look at a second population, you can again see that it's quite dynamic. So in a given year, one population might experience positive selection on clutch size, whereas another population will experience negative. Another year, perhaps they both experience negative selection, but one is much stronger, uh, experiencing selection much stronger than on the other one. And so previous analyses have looked at the temporal dynamics of, uh, of, of selection through time, but I was interested in the, uh, my colleagues and I were interested in the spatial variation. So when there's this much variation in going on in selection, what's changing? Is it the strength of selection that's varying more or the direction of selection that's varying more? And so what we did was we assembled a global database of selection estimates from around the world. And each data point is a different type of organism. So we looked at plants and invertebrates and vertebrates. And what we found was that there is spatial variation in selection and there's a, uh, there's a signature of spatial variation in selection. And that the selection tends to vary more in the strength as opposed to the direction. So, so we're starting to understand the patterns of spatial variation and selection. Further work has found that one of the drivers, quite interestingly, of the spatial vari variation and selection are global precipitation patterns. Interestingly, not temperature though. And so we're starting to get an understanding of spatial variation and selection. Now these selection estimates though are all from natural populations. And I'm interested though in how selection might be changing in relation to other things. Namely, I'm interested in how humans might be changing selection and thus evolution and adaptation. So in this paper, in this review, we were, for better or for worse, credited as being the world's greatest evolutionary force. And this led to my colleagues and I, we put together a special issue in the Philosophical Transaction of the Royal Society, focusing on different human influences and their effects on society and evolution. And we touched on a diff variety of different human influences. When you start to think of the number of ways we've changed the world and we're changing selection, it's really quite extensive. So we focused on pollution, we looked at pollution, eutrophication, harvesting, urbanization, climate change, emerging infectious diseases, antibiotics, all sorts of things. And so today I'm gonna talk to you about some of these different human influences that I've been looking at in my research. So I'm gonna focus on three questions today and I'll take you through each one. And the first one is very straightforward. Does hunting affect adaptive behavior? And so for this, uh, the hunting that I'm going to be talking about actually is spearfishing. And what's great about uh, spearfishing and adaptive behavior is that we can look at it in relation to different variables. So the uh, metric I measured is flight initiation distance. So it's the distance where a prey flees an approaching predator. So the distance at which if there's a predator going after a prey item, the distance at which it will run away. And it's a variable va behavior that we know varies in relation to things such as body size or distance to refuge or speed of approach. And I did this in parrotfish because they're an abundant reef fish in Barbados where I did this work and they're targeted by spear fishermen there. And so on the island of Barbados, we did our sampling over here on the west coast where they have a fringing coral reef here. And what was interesting about this reef is that there's a marine reserve protected area here in green. So in this marine protected area, you are not allowed to spearfish, whereas outside of the marine protected area, you are allowed to spearfish. So you have different populations of parrotfish experiencing hunting or no hunting. So I quantified flight initiation distance in these parrotfish. So on the y-axis is the flight initiation distance. And when we talk about flight initiation distance, it's often used as a proxy for anti-predator behavior. And so the lower you are on the axis, the less anti-predator behavior you have. It means the more close you will allow a potential predator before you decide to run away. And as you go up the y-axis, you have increased anti-predator behavior. So the distance you're gonna run away uh, sooner, uh, at a greater distance of an approaching prey. And so it, we have data from both inside and outside of the reserve and looking at the body size that are targeted by spearfisher, which is over 25 centimeters. We found that outside of the reserve, so where there's spearfishing, there is increased flight initiation distance. So there's increased anti-predator behavior where parrotfish are allowed to be hunted. So does hunting affect adaptive behavior? Yes, it does. In this particular case, uh, anti-predator behavior. So for my second question, does urbanization influence adaptation in Darwin's finches? I'm gonna take you to the Galapagos Islands. 
So the Galapagos Islands are an island archipelago uh, located about a thousand kilometers off the coast of South America. And uh, a couple of years ago, they were quite well known. So um, I don't study that, unfortunately, as much as I would like to. Um, so that uh, video clip won a British television award. And um, uh, for people unfamiliar with the Galapagos, uh, they, they, they really enjoyed that clip. The other thing that the Galapagos Islands are renowned, uh, renowned for are for inspiring a young Charles Darwin when he visited the Galapagos Islands on his around the world voyage on the HMS Beagle. And inspired by the Galapagos is how Charles Darwin came to develop his theory of evolution. And Charles Darwin documented his voyage in a book called The Voyage of the Beagle. And at the University of Cambridge, they actually have a first edition copy. And so I managed to convince the librarian to let me look at it. And I was very excited about that. So in this, he documents his, um, just basically his adventures around the world and some of the things that he did as a naturalist. So some of the things that he did as a naturalist are, was to do things such as ride the giant tortoises. And another thing he describes doing is that he would pick up these marine iguanas and he'd throw them in the water and then they'd swim back to him and then he'd be, pick them up and he'd throw them in the water again and they'd swim back. And he was sort of marveling at how they would keep coming back to him after they kept throwing him in the water after they kept, he kept throwing iguanas in the water. And so needless to say, we are not allowed to do either of these things anymore. Now, the other thing that the Galapagos Islands are known for are for the Darwin's finches. And it's really quite interesting. When Charles Darwin went to the Galapagos Islands originally, he actually wasn't that interested in the finches. He thought they were kind of a, this dull brown and black color and that they had a terrible song. And he wasn't very interested in them. And so when he collected his finches, he put them all in the same bag. And he collected from multiple islands and he collected multiple species, but he didn't realize that at the time. And so when he got back to England and was looking through his specimens and realizing all this morphological and body size variation in the Darwin's finches, or what are now known as the Darwin's, Darwin's finches, he realized that there might be what became to know, uh, what now we now know of as local adaptation. And luckily for him, other researchers though, on both the Beagle and in previous uh, expeditions, had sampled finches and labeled them properly on which island they came from. And so he was able to know which uh, species were on which islands. Now on the Galapagos Islands though, there are four islands that now have permanent human populations. And when I'm talking about a human population, I'm talking about towns and cities. And so this is an aerial view of Porta Yoro, which is the largest town. Mm -hmm. And you can see that there's a lot of infrastructure there. There's paved roads and trucks and grocery stores and um, uh, bars and uh, hostels and everything you need. So the proper towns that are now on the Galapagos Islands. And over the past 60 years, you can see that there's been an exponential increase in both the number of tourists and the number of visitors, as well as in the permanent human population. And these data end at 2010. The most recent data from 2018 has um, 280,000 visitors in 2018, and the permanent human population is at about 30,000 right now. So in the past 60 years, we've seen an exponential increase in the number of humans on the Galapagos. And the reason that um, there's, this could be quite interesting, for better or for worse, is because we've looked at the effects of urbanization on phenotypic rates of change. So this is another database where we assembled uh, data points, and each data point is a different type of organism. Again, we looked at both plants, uh, we looked at plants, invertebrates, and vertebrates. And each data point, what we did is you quantified a particular phenotypic trait and if it changed through time. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, and then what we did was we looked at the different uh, rates of change and how they uh, re related to urbanization. And what we found is that urbanization has a signature on phenotypic rates of change. So ur urbanization is affecting potential adaptation through changes in um, phenotypic rates of change. Now, when it comes to the Galapagos, I wanted to take, I'm going to take you through three different questions. And the first is, well, do humans have an influence on Darwin's finches? Maybe the presence of humans is an affecting thing, and we don't have to worry about uh, the impacts that we might be having on the Galapagos Islands. And so to do this, I'm going to take you to our main study island, which is Santa Cruz here. And we have two st study sites on Santa Cruz Island. We have our remote site um, here at El Garapetero, and then we have a site here that we call Academy Bay.
And I'm going to first take you and show you some data from El Garapetero. And what I first want to point out is that there's a tight link between uh, bill morphology and size in the Darwin's finches and the types of foods that they eat. So you have the ground finches here, you have the small ground finch, the medium ground finch, the large ground finch, and then the cactus finch. And you can see that their beak sizes vary from small to quite large. And these beaks are designed to be crushers, so they're designed to crush seeds. And what we know is that the small ground finches will feed on the smaller um, seeds here, but they lack the size and the strength to crack the larger, harder seeds. Whereas for the large ground finch, their beaks are so large that they can't handle the very small seeds. So each of these species of finches is adapted to exploit a very specific ecological niche or certain type of seed type. And you can see with the cactus finch, it has a very long pointed bill. And this is so it can get to the center of the cactus flowers to get to the nectar. So there's a very tight link between the environment or the food availability and the different species or beak sizes of these Darwin's finches. Now, when we go to our remote site, that El Garapetero, it's really quite interesting because the medium ground finch here is actually, seem, is actually occurring in two different morphs. So there's a small morph medium ground finch and then a large morph medium ground finch along with also your small ground finch and your large ground finch. And if you look at a distribution of the beak size, you can basically see a bimodal distribution. And so basically what's happening is there's something that's selecting against this medium beak size and that's what is maintaining this bimodal distribution. Now if we go to Academy Bay, uh, the site, our second site, what we know is that there is a bimodal distribution historically. Uh, these are data from 1964. But when you look at more contemporary data, this, in this particular case 2004, you no longer have that bimodal distribution. You now have a more <coughs> homogeneous distribution of beak sizes. So basically that bimodality that used to exist historically at this one particular site in terms of beak shape is now gone. And so the question then becomes, well, what, what's different? Why has, why might that, um, what might be going on to cause that lack, uh, to lose that bimodality in the distribution of beak shapes? And as I mentioned to you before, the data, or historical data was from 1964, and the current data is from here in the mid-2000s. And so you can see that what's changed is the number of permanent residents and visitors. And the, the site that we sampled it is right next to Portayora, which is the largest town in um, the Galapagos. So it could be that it has something to do with the presence of humans, and that it appears that with us showing up and then establishing a very strong presence on the Galapagos Islands, that we have managed to change the distribution of beak shapes in this particular population. So it does appear that humans are having an influence on Darwin's finches. So the question then becomes, well, what is it about the humans that might be causing this change that has resulted in the loss of the bimodal distribution? And so the next question we wanted to ask is, are human changing the niche characteristics of Darwin's finches? So niche characteristics is just a fancy way of saying the types of foods that they eat. And so just to remind you, right now there's a tight link, uh, in, at least among the species, there's a tight link in the types of food they eat or the environment that they are living in and the beak shape. And so what might be changing is the types of food that the finches are eating and the types of foods that they are feeding on. And so I'm going to be showing you data looking at differences between small and medium ground finches um, because we don't have the uh, bimodal uh, distribution in um, Academy Bay anymore. And we can make two different predictions. First is we can predict that the niche breadth between finches at our remote site and at the finches next to town will differ in their breadth. So breadth simply means the variety of foods that they're going to eat given the types of foods that are available. So if you have a very narrow niche breadth, it means that even of all the types of foods that are available, you're only eating a couple of types of foods. Whereas if you have wide niche breadth, you're going to be, of all the types of foods that are available, you're eating all of them. The other thing we would expect um, that would be maintaining these differences between the beak is niche overlap. So that's how many of the same types of foods they're eating. And so if what's maintaining this, this differences between the small and the medium ground finch are the types of food items, that means the small ground finch will be eating their types of foods, the medium ground finch will be eating their types of foods, and there won't be very much overlap. Whereas here next to town, we might expect that there would be high niche overlap where they're all eating the same types of foods. <coughs> 
So to do this, we did uh, walking, uh, walking transects, where, transects, where basically we just walked and looked for finches that were feeding, and we observed what the finches were. Uh, we observed what the finches were eating specifically. So on the y-axis, you have niche breadth. So this is, again, about the types, eating the types of foods that are available. So if you have high niche breadth, it means you're eating more of the foods that are, all ava that are available, whereas if you have narrow niche breadth or lower niche breadth, you're eating fewer of all the food types that are available. And then in blue will be the medium ground finch, and red will be the small ground finch. And then across the x-axis, what we have is basically a gradient from no human presence, which is our remote site, to our site that was next to town, and then we did transects actually in town as well to look at the urban finches. And what we saw was that as you, when you get into town and in the site next to, um, next to town, that the, both the small and medium ground finch have higher niche breadth. So finches at, at the adjacent site and in town are eating more of the, the types of foods uh, that are available, more types of them. So our prediction holds true that at the remote site there's narrow niche breadth, whereas at uh, the site next to town there is a wider niche breadth. Now when it comes to niche overlap, again on the y-axis what you have is at the top here, it means of the foods that are available they're eating the same types of food, whereas if you have narrow overlap it means they're, you're eating your different types of food and you're not eating the same types of food. Again, we have the gradient going across from a uh, remote site to adjacent to town to in town. And what we found is that niche overlap uh, increases as you get into town. So in town, the finches are eating the same types of foods. They're not differentiating and eating separate types of foods anymore. So when it comes to these expectations based on what we observe, it does appear that we have changed the niche characteristics of the Darwin's finches. And so the question though is, is we're talking about niche characteristics and types of foods, but what about the, what are these foods that they are eating? And so the last question I wanted to ask is, do Darwin's finches prefer human foods? And the reason the human foods is important is because it doesn't matter what size or shape beak you have uh, to consume human foods. You don't, you can be a small finch or a large finch and you'll still be able to eat bread and potato chips and french fries and pizza. It doesn't matter what size bill you have. And so again, just to emphasize uh, exponential increase in the number of human population, uh, in the number of visitors and permanent human residents. And the thing is, is that we've brought our foods along because we can't eat the seeds that Darwin's finches eat. So we have to bring our own foods. So we've changed the types of foods that are available to humans, uh, sorry, to the finches by bringing human foods. And they're quite cheeky. They'll even take breakfast right out of your bowl. and I have no problem doing it. That one's in milk. So we know that the finches are eating the human foods and we know their niche characteristics are different, but are the finches preferentially feeding on human foods? Is it more just opportunity? So to do this, we gave them a cafeteria experiment. So we basically gave them a tray that has the foods that they're supposed to be eating and then the human foods here. And we just put them out and let the finches come to the trays and then consume the food. And then we quantified how much of the food was consumed afterwards. And they really quite enjoyed, so this is a, one of our sites, one of our trials in town, and you can see they uh, are quite active and they were even fighting over uh, access to the tray. So on the y-axis, I'm going to show you three plots, and then they go from our remote site where there's no humans, our site that's adjacent to town, and then we actually did trials in town. And for each of these plots, on the left are your human foods, and I don't know what you call them in English here, but just in case, crisps and biscuits translates to potato chips and cookies. I don't know which words you use here. Um, and then on the right side are the foods that they're supposed to be eating. On the y-axis is the amount of food that's consumed. And so if we look at our remote site, the finches didn't come to the trays that often, and when they did come to the trays, they weren't particularly interested in either the foods that they were supposed to be eating or the human foods. When we look at the trials, though, at the adjacent site, there does start to seem to be a preference for some of the human foods, in this particular case, rice. But what becomes quite clear is that in town, if you give the finches a choice, they preferentially consume the human foods uh, quite a bit. So 
In town, at least, the finches preferentially feed on human foods. So are they preferring human foods? Yes, it does appear. And so that, um, those human foods and our changes to the niches, we think are some of the things that are underlying that loss of bimodality in the site a population of finches next to town. So does urbanization influence adaptation in Darwin's finches? It does appear to be, and there's still a lot of work that we're doing on the effects of urbanization on Darwin's finches. Now the final question that I wanted to, to talk to you about today is can Darwin's finches adapt to the presence of invasive species? Now on the Galapagos Islands, unfortunately, we've introduced mammalian predators where historically there have been no mammalian predators. So there's now the presence of house cats and black rats on, these, on some of the islands in the Galapagos. And the reason this is important is because as Charles Darwin himself noted, all of the terrestrial birds are often approached sufficiently near to be killed with a switch and sometimes as I myself tried with a cap or a hat. So you could literally go and throw a hat on a finch. Um, we do not do that anymore either. So there's this evolutionary naivety in these terrestrial birds having evolved for thousands of years in the absence of mammalian predators. And so I'm just going to take you through sort of four logical questions looking at the effects of invasive predators on behavior in Darwin's finches. So the first is, does the presence of invasive predators increase anti-predator behavior? We would think it, 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 uh, it would, but maybe you know, the presence of invasive predators simply has not affected the Darwin's finches at all. So to do that, I looked at among island comparisons of anti-predator behavior. So on four of the islands, we have introduced cats and rats on these four islands. And then on two of the islands, we have islands that are pristine. They have no history whatsoever of invasive cats or rats. And what I quantified again was flight initiation distance. So again, that's the distance at which a prey will flee from an approaching predator. And the more flight initiation distance you have, you have higher anti-predator behavior and lower anti-predator means you have decreased anti-predator behavior. On the x-axis you have the six islands, so the left two islands are the pristine islands and the right four islands are the islands that have the presence of cats and rats. And when I quantified the flight initiation distance, on islands that have the invasive predators, they have increased anti-predator, uh, sorry, when it, on islands that have invasive predators, they have increased anti-predator behavior as compared to islands that are pristine. So yes, the presence of invasive predators increases anti-predator behavior. So the next question then is, what happens though to this increased anti-predator behavior if you eradicate the uh, house cats and black rats? And I can ask this question because on two islands that have had invasive mammalian predators, the park has successfully eradicated these particular cats and rats. And what I think is interesting is that very little work has looked at behavioral uh, adaptations post-eradication. A lot of work has focused on species recovery, um, uh, mating, uh, food webs, and those sorts of things. But very little has looked at how behavior has, either, has or has not reverted once you've removed predators. And the reason this might be interesting is because if it's maintained, it suggests that the flight increased anti-predator behavior might have a genetic basis, which means it might be an evolved trait. Whereas if it was a purely plastic trait and you remove the predators then you would and there was a cost to increased anti-predator behavior, you would expect that the uh, anti-predator behavior would revert back to sort of historical levels. And so here again is the plot. So here are the two pristine islands. Here are the four islands with the invasive predators. And then here are the two islands that have successfully er eradicated predators. And what we found, or what I found, is that increased anti-predator behavior is maintained on these particular islands. Now, these islands had their eradications in 2003 and 2008, and these data were collected around 2016 and 2017. So there's been several generations, so they have a generation time of about one year. So between eight and 13 years have elapsed. And so if this was a purely plastic trait, I would, have, I would have argued that that's been enough time for there to be a reversion in the anti-predator behavior. That being said, however, there are a few things I can't rule out, such as this is learned behavior that is being culturally transmit, transmitted from generation to generation. So that could be a possibility. But for the moment, it's a little tantalizing to think that because it's been maintained that it might be an actually evolved trait. So the other question I wanted to ask is, does urbanization affect behavior? Now, with urbanization, I know many people here are familiar with urbanization, 
But if you're not familiar with urbanization, again, we can see an exponential increase in the permanent population on the Galapagos. We can make two different predictions. One might be that in an urban area, because of increased resources, you have a high density of predators. So maybe you would expect that with the increased number of predators, you would have increased flight initiation distance. Conversely, you also have large number of stimuli in the urban areas, and so there's a very uh, likely possibility that perhaps the finches are going to become habituated, even though there's predators there, and will have lower anti-predator behavior. And so I looked at urban and non-urban comparisons on these four islands. Now, the data that I showed you earlier about the increased anti-predator behavior, these were all finches that were found in non-urban areas. So these were in remote areas. And so the data that I'm going to show you now are finches that, were, uh, that I basically chased in town. And so you can see that on one of the islands, there's a non-significant, although visually it looks like there's a difference, there's a non-significant difference where the finches have lower FID, or anti-predator behavior. But on these three islands, the finches have decreased anti-predator behavior. Now these islands are labeled um, from the smallest population, which is a permanent population of 111, to the largest population, which is 1,200. And so based on these results up here, what we might think is that there's an urbanization threshold that will lower anti-predator behavior in Darwin's finches. Although the threshold is not very large, because Isabella, this population, it's a permanent po human population, is about 1,200. So it's not a very large threshold, but it looks like it doesn't matter um, about the population size. It's more about whether or not it's urban or urban enough, I should say, or not urban. Now the other interesting thing about this is that what you can see here from these data is that flight initiation distance is actually lower than it is on islands that have had no history whatsoever of invasive predators or humans. And so what this means is that urbanization can strongly counteract any adaptations to the presence of invasive predators, which can have conservation implications. So does urbanization affect behavior? Yes, it does. It appears it's a more of a threshold as opposed to degree of urbanization that is affecting anti-predator behavior. And anti-predator behavior is actually lower than on islands that have had no history whatsoever with humans or with invasive predators. So for my final question is, is it replicable? Because what I did for these particular data was I used myself as the stimulus or the uh, predator. So I was the one, or my field assistants, we were the ones who chased the finches and then measured the distance. And I've been talking about invasive predators and those sorts of things, and so you might say, well, Kyoko, uh, you don't really look like a cat. Like, can you really be saying things about invasive cats? And so I tried to get a real cat, and that wasn't possible, so I did the next best thing, which is I got a fake cat. So this is Bartolome, um, and you can see Bartolome cannot move, so I put him on a remote control car. <laughs> So um, this is what the uh, apparatus looks like. I used five different cats uh, randomly, and they're all named after islands. So this is Floriana, that's Isabella, there's Pachalame, there is Pinzon, and then there is Darwin right there. And they're reading a book on domestic cats. Um, so what it looks like from the cat's perspective, there's a finch right here, and it flies away. And then you put a marker where the finch is, you put a marker where the car is, and then you measure the distance. So it's a very straightforward way of quantifying anti-predator behavior in Darwin's finches. And so then, yeah, we take a tape measure, and we measure the distance. And then if you're wondering what it looks like from the finch perspective, this is what they see. <laughs> so there we go. All right. So what did we find? So for logistical purposes, um, I could only use the cat on the four islands that have the urban, non-urban uh, dis uh, distinction. So the left are the data that I used myself for a field assistant as a stimulus, and on the right are the data for the cat. Now what you can see is that the urban effect of lowered or decreased anti-predator behavior is maintained between urban and non-urban populations on all four islands. And this is preliminary data, I'm still crunching the numbers, so I'm not 100% sure what's, uh, what's going on with these data. But in general, this trend of decreased anti-predator behavior, uh, anti-predator behavior in urban areas compared to non-urban areas holds across all four islands when using the cat as a stimulus. So in terms of is it replicable, uh, and, and can I properly, can I make inferences about invasive cats, uh, I would argue that yes, I am allowed to do this. <laughs>
So can Darwin's finches adapt to the presence of invasive species? Yes, they can. And there's also some interesting things in terms of the effects of urbanization on anti-predator behavior <coughs> in Darwin's finches. So today I've talked to you about different human influences. I showed you how hunting can increase anti-predator behavior in parrotfish. I showed you how exponential increase in the permanent human presence of uh, on the Galapagos Islands, and that this has changed things such as beak shape distributions, and that we have changed the niche characteristics of the Darwin's finches to the point where Darwin's finches actually preferentially feed on human foods in town. And I've shown you that Darwin's finches have adapted to the presence of invasive predators, that this adaption is maintained even when you remove those predators, and that urbanization can strongly counteract any ad adaptations to invasive predators. And the reason I think this is quite important is that it shows the consequences of human interactions with nature and how we humans are affecting evolution and adaptation by influencing selection. So this goes to show we are having a very strong evolutionary force and maybe we are, unfortunately, the world's greatest evolutionary <laughs> force now. And so with that, I'd like to thank my funding sources and all the people who have helped me in the field and helped me develop the presentation. And I'd like to thank you all for coming and for listening, and I'll be happy to take any questions. <laughs> Go ahead, Danny. So in your analysis of, uh, of variation of uh, natural selection, uh, what, what do you use? Is, uh, are they um, selection differentials or gradients? Or Both. Both. Yeah. And, and so ho what, what, what are the, the, the compounds that you control in the, in the analysis? Because, uh, um, of course, um, the strength of selection will depend on, on many different things. Maybe yeah. some studies were in places that were changing very fast, some others. Yeah. So, in terms of the selection estimates, one of the criteria was that they had to be from not natural populations that were not subjected to any type of um, human uh, clear cutting or, 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 or and nothing experimental, so no common garden or transplant exper experiments were included. This was only estimates of selection that were, somebody went out into a population, estimated selection and then left. Um, or, well, they replicated it temporarily, temporarily and or spatially. Now, in terms of other things, uh, we use the published literature for this, and so we included variables as random effects such as study, uh, the, the paper, because some papers studied multiple species, some papers um, used, um, uh, you know, they measured different things. Uh, we included things such as taxa, uh, and we included things such as the type of trait that was measured, um, that was used as the uh, fitness proxy. So if it was a life history trait or a survival or or uh, um, uh, reproduction or something like that, since there are different estimates of fitness as well. So we included as, ma as many of those types of things in the analysis to account for it. And we, um, was, this was done in collaboration with um, Michael Morrissey, who's big on the um, statistical uh, analyses of evolutionary studies. And so he was, the, he was the driving force behind the analysis. And they used a Bayesian framework to try and account for uh, all this uncertainty that is introduced from things such as observer bias or study bias or, or those sorts of things. Oh, yeah. So, um, in your in your ex field experiment with the Darwin finches, you're talking about risk-taking behavior, right? And there's a there's a trade-off in risk-taking behavior, like the costs of being killed by a predator, but also the benefits of getting more food. Mm -hmm. um, my question is in the direction of: Is it possible that the distribution of the resources is different in the urban areas as compared with the natural areas, so that the costs of missing a feeding opportunity is actually smaller or larger in one place than on the other? Yes, yeah, that's very real. The, the, the resource availability, especially in terms of the human foods, is much higher in urban areas than it is in non-urban areas. So there is a very real possibility that the distribution of food could be affecting other things such as risk behavior, uh, anti-predator behavior, or risk, or risk taking, or that sort of stuff. And that's something that we haven't quantified formally and should be something we should do. Yeah. Yes, I have one question related with with one of the other. Um, you use the, the term preference 
to refer to the choices the fences made in the in the town, but actually I I saw that they show preference for for rice, mm -hmm. and if rice is functionally similar to to the to the items they they choice in Christian areas, mm -hmm. they there are actually no need to to think that these choices in town might might have evolutionary consequence and and therefore it might be a consequence of of resource uh, density in towns mm -hmm. rather than 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 preference for for, for yeah. human food uh, it could be so what i didn't show is that we also did the cafeteria experiments on the beach so the beach is about, it's in a remote site, it's near our, our, our remote area. We work away from the beach, so it's just the scientists there. But on the beach, there's a lot of tourists and they bring picnics and they bring human foods, but it's not in an urban area. And when you do the trials there, you get the same results as in town, where the finches prefer the human foods to the foods that they're not, uh, the, the foods that they're supposed to be eating. So it is possible that, um, then this ties back to your question, Royal, it is possible that the resource distribution and that sort of stuff could be affecting it, but at the beach, it's the only difference is the presence of humans and human foods. There's no urban area. There's no restaurants or anything like that there. So, and you get the same results where the finches um, uh, prefer the human foods. And part of the reason actually this whole study came about was because we would go to the beach and we'd open up a crisp packet and it would, it would crinkle and make that noise. And then all of a sudden you'd see like five finches in front of you. And they would, some of them were pretty cheeky. They, you could sit there and hold the bag and they would just, they like look at you and they're like, okay. <laughs> Okay, open the bag, start eating your crisps. So, um, so, so, so that was an observation that sort of led to this whole, wait, well, do, are they really preferring human foods over the foods they're supposed to be eating? Yeah. So then is the preference of human foods because they have higher calorie density? Or it might be. So that's something we'd like to look at. Um, we do have nutritional information for the foods they're supposed to be eating, and then we also, I wrote down the, well, you can get the, the same foods that we bought uh, and get the nutritional content. So it could be that as well. Um, I've also uh, not presented it, but I also looked at other reasons why they might be preferring it, and I thought maybe there was a taste thing as well. Uh, and ta there is taste preferences, but it's variable uh, between species and among populations. So there's nothing consistent about taste preferences, at least with Darwin's finches. But yeah, there is a question of why they would be going for the human foods. Um, and then one of the other things that I'm looking at is uh, what are the consequences of it? Because it's, um, uh, I mean, crisps and uh, they might have higher fat, but they have less nutrients uh, and maybe like less protein or something like that than the foods that they're, the seeds that they're supposed to be eating have. So I'm, some of the things I'm looking at are the downstream consequences of that as well. So as a follow-up question, um, have you guys measured the fat content on these animals? Like, is it possible that there's differences in the, the fat content, like the body condition on animals on urban areas as compared with natural areas? So for the longest time, I thought that they didn't have uh, fat patches, but it turns out they do. And so I need to have someone train me on how to read them. And so I can start to try and qu uh, quantify that on the finches. We have mass, um, urban fin and, and previous work has looked at urban and non-urban differences. Urban finches, I think, are larger in general. They're heavier than on uh, non-urban finches. Um, I can't remember offhand if on the beach they're heavier than non-urban finches. I can, I can look that up really quickly for you. But uh, yeah. yeah. Nope. Um, you know that there is now some, some researchers that propose that we humans are actually increasing biodiversity, not just um, decreasing. And there's a famous book now that is very controversial about this. And because we are um, an introducing many species, but also we are uh, favoring or, or promoting the evolution of other species. And so what do you think about this? Uh, do you really think that we are creating new species? No. I mean, from a philosophical point of view, I think we're destroying more than we're creating anything. Mainly because we're changing things so fast and the organisms can't adapt fast enough uh, or evolve fast enough into basically what would be another species or diversify. And as we saw here, we've actually lost diversification. So, um, so I, I disagree with that statement, basically, but on a personal level, um, but also from a scientific view based on the research that I've been looking at. Do you think that in the future, if 
at some point all of these differences in the morphology will not exist and you will see all the individuals in the same yeah. type. P potentially. For the moment, we can still differentiate species in town. Um, we, the bimodal distribution is actually very hard to see in nature, unless you've looked at loads and loads of finches. But even then, there's, um, there's a quote that says basically the only people who can tell a Darwin's finch species properly is God and Peter Grant. And so, <laughs> so there's, a lot, there's a lot of variation. I mean, we say there's these four species, but when you look at the PCA plots, yes, they separate out into different species, but there's a lot of overlap. And, and so, um, so for the moment, the species are seeming to be maintained uh, in urban areas, but through time, with time, that could change. The other thing, though, is that the urban finches don't breed in town because they don't have very many of the cacti that they make their nests in. So they do have to go somewhere else for breeding. So that might be enough to maintain variation by having to go, not being able to eat the human foods um, in town when they're breeding. I mean, they do breed in town, but just not nearly as many as you'd find like in our remote site, for example. So it's possible that there might one day, if the towns get large enough, that we'll see a sort of real collapse of the different species. Um, because they can hybridize and that sort of stuff. But the other thing that maintains the species is not only the beak shape, but the song is different among the species. So um, that's one way I think that they, even with the lack of selection on the size of their uh, beak shape from food, they still at this point have a sort of mating through song identification, so that might be able to maintain the species. But that's, yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm hoping to keep going back, so ask me in uh, ask me in a few years, and we'll see what happens longitudinally. So, um, yeah. are, are there different responses for for generally some species? Yes, and actually, that's a paper I can give you that uh, Luis de Leon uh, he classified Darwin's finches as imperfect generalists. Uh, so they are generalists in general. Um, they eat seeds, but in the rainy season they eat invertebrates, and um, during the rainy season they'll eat uh, fruits and, and that sort of stuff. So they are um, fairly opportunistic uh, during the breeding season. Um, it's mostly in the droughts where you get the selection bouts uh, when all the easy food, the caterpillars and the uh, seeds, uh, the, the fruits disappear and you're just left with the hard seeds. But in general, um, they are considered generalists. The finches are. Even though, even though each of their beaks are specialized to eat different types of foods, they do, um, uh, they're, they're, I think they're considered more generalist side than the specialist side. But I should look that up for you and double check. All right, let's, let's take this. Here we go for the